welcome and good day to each of you. As the director of TEFINET, the global network of field epidemiology training programs, it is my honor to thank you for joining our webinar celebrating the very first World Field Epidemiology Day. If you are on social media, I encourage you to tweet and post along with this event using the hashtag World Field Epidemiology Day. Tefinet began developing the idea of a World Field Epidemiology Day campaign in January 2020, just before COVID-19 became a pandemic, bringing the field of public health to the forefront. Tefinet has envisaged World Field Epidemiology Day as an annual global effort to recognize and raise awareness of the vital role of field epidemiologists in protecting the health of populations and advancing global health security, and to advocate for increased investment in field epidemiology training, research, and professionals. Field epidemiologists have been instrumental in the global response to COVID-19. They conduct disease surveillance, outbreak investigations and contact tracing, work with communities on disease prevention, and so much more. The members of our network have been working around the clock. Now, more than ever, every country must have sufficient field epidemiology capacity to safeguard and promote the health of its citizens. Field epidemiology training programs have trained an estimated 19,000 disease detectives but the world needs more. As we know, all pandemics begin as local outbreaks. Field epidemiologists are uniquely equipped with skills for early detection and control of these diseases locally and after they spread. On September 7, 1854, English physician John Snow took the findings of his cholera outbreak investigation to local officials in London. These findings led officials to disable the contaminated water pump that Snow identified as the source of the outbreak. Today, the data generated by field epidemiologists continues to provide vital evidence to decision makers for use in designing effective public health interventions. For our first World Field Epidemiology Day, I am proud to be joined by a multitude of powerful voices in public health to highlight the important work of field epidemiologists and to call upon global leaders to support efforts to build the global field epidemiology capacity that all countries urgently require. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the event. My name is Amreen Chaudhary. I am a field epidemiologist from Pakistan. Hi, I am Dr. Surinder Munhajabati. I am a field epidemiologist from India. I am a field epidemiologist graduated from Turkey. Happy World Field Epidemiologist Day from Kenya to the world. I feel so privileged, especially during these times of COVID-19, that I get to be fully involved in combating the outbreak, knowing that at the end of the day, I have made a positive change in somebody's life. This profession has taken me to the most incredible places in the world, and the best friends I have found in life, I have found through being a field epidemiologist. I can play Sherlock Holmes to different diseases, epidemics, pandemics, and also keep a tap on the fragile balance between the environment and the human race. And what really fascinated me in my job is that uh, during the different outbreaks such as pneumonic plague, measles and COVID-19 in, in our region, I had the opportunity to participate and bring my expertise not only in the field of investigation and lab, but also uh, the coordination. The analytical and critical skills that I got have become my profession in my current jobs. Interacting with people from the community, understanding their disease experiences, and then applying my field epidemiological skills to solving their problems is what makes me passionate about my work. One of the reasons I love my job is the ability to work with people from diverse backgrounds and still achieve a common goal. 
today is the day we raise our voices a special voice at that for the contribution that the epidemiologists have done especially last year at the height of the pandemic i truly believe their work in disease detection outbreak control and even contact tracing shouldn't and can't be underrated i believe when boots are on the ground we can make a difference Hello, as a graduate of an FETP program myself, it is a real pleasure for me to celebrate World Field Epidemiology Day with you. At WHO, we identify 4,500 public health events with epidemic potential every month. Every day, I see the vital role played by field epidemiologists to investigate those events. Rapid verification and robust epidemiologic investigation in the field is one of the most critical factors of successful control of outbreaks. As such, it is imperative that local field epidemiologists are ready to respond as soon as it is needed. This capacity is so important that it's specified in the international health regulations as one of the core capacities that all countries should have. For larger public health events, the global network of field epidemiologists enables professionals to be deployed to assist local responses. At WHO, we highly value our partnership with Tefinet and GORN, the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, that enable international field missions to include strong field epidemiologists. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, the demands on field epidemiologists were growing. However, the last year and a half has pushed the world's public health capacities to the maximum. Field epidemiologists have played vital roles in many different ways, from surveillance, contact tracing, outbreak investigations, research studies, and many other aspects of national and international response. However, the pandemic has highlighted what has been an already evolving reality, that field epidemiologists are increasingly working in multidisciplinary teams. As part of our work as a field epidemiologist, we need to work with data scientists, information technology professionals, social scientists, communicators, and a range of different decision makers within health, public health and other parts of government. This year, in partnership with colleagues from TEFINET and CDC, I was fortunate to be part of the establishment of the Strategic Leadership Group for Field Epidemiology. The overarching goal of the group is to strengthen the work of FETP training programs around the world and to promote FETP career pathways for the future. Another exciting development at WHO is the creation of the WHO Hub for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence, based in Berlin, which will revolutionize the way we identify and respond to public health risks. Field epidemiologists will be a critical part of that effort. There has never been a more exciting time to be a field epidemiologist or to consider training in field epidemiology. From WHO Geneva, I wish you my very best on World Field Epidemiology Day. Welcome to the office in Malta. So this is the office early in the morning and most of the work happens either here at the office or working from home. A lot of the things that we do in the C surveillance are to check how the interventions that we have are working in the case of COVID. That means, for example, looking at the effectiveness of vaccines on those hospitalized patients. We look at the hospitalized data and what I do from my side, and what other APA fellows would do, I go in to analyze this data. And then at the end of the day, and I analyze it through different logistic regressions to find what are the vaccine effectiveness estimates. So you as an APA fellow and as a world, as an field epidemiology will do is we make sure that the information that is gathered through data makes it to the people that need to take decisions. And that's why we say happy world field epidemiology day. Hi everyone. I'm Charlotte and I'm currently a second year EPI Fellow. 
I'm actually right now returning from deployment to Papua New Guinea and as you can see behind me, well, or at least I hope you can actually see, I'm filming this from the airport in Singapore from where I will then travel to Doha and then back to Helsinki which is where I'm currently based for the two years of my fellowship. There isn't really like a standard day when you're on deployment or at least not on most deployments um, but working in EPI and surveillance means that you could be tasked with analyzing sort of routine data or you could also be doing some sort of more in-depth epidemiological analyses but then the, the other really important side of deployments is often capacity building. Now all of these deployments are sort of like high stress, high workload usually, but they're also really, really fun and extremely culturally enriching. And that makes them some of the, the best parts of being a field epi. And you can, you can definitely see like a very strong work hard, play hard vibe going around. Hi, my name is Dr. Andreas Hofer. I'm a UFM Fellow from Cohort 2019. I'm originally from Germany and I have been um, doing the program here from Madrid. One of the things that I liked most about this, the UFM uh, training in, this, uh, in the days of the pandemic was uh, the effort that my host site and that the UFM program went through to allow me to participate and to contribute my past experience towards the mitigation of the pandemic in Spain. Um, during this time, I was able to participate in three different COVID-related projects, one of which was a what would be considered one of the first COVID-19 outbreaks in Spain, which was in Tenerife. Um, we also participated in an outbreak that was occurring in a refugee reception center in Melilla. Um, when we came back from that, I was allowed to participate in the diagnostic support part of the pipeline um, from receiving the samples to doing the PCRs to sending the results so that we can all do what we can to uh, help get this under control. Hello, my name is Bojana Mahmutovic. Uh, I'm an uh, APIT Fellow, Cohort 2020, MS Trek, Croatia, and I'm also Epidemiology Specialist working in Institute of Public Health in Krapinsko-Zagorska County in Croatia. I have been working in epidemiology department since 2014 uh, and my job has been quite interesting and challenging those last six months uh, while we starting vaccinating people it has been in a way a relief because we finally feel that we we are helping and that we can make a change uh, but before that, all those uh, new daily cases, all those uh, contacts, contact tracing, uh, COVID deaths, it have been, in one word, really, really challenging year. The Zambia FETP uh, was launched in 2014 and uh, to date we've graduated uh, three cohorts of the advanced program and we've also graduated six cohorts from the frontline program. The quality of the investigations that we do uh, during outbreaks, we have had the cholera outbreak, we have had now the COVID pandemic and in these two uh, we have had a lot of publications from residents, especially the advanced. So either they are lead authors or they are also uh, part of the, the teams that are investigating and uh, participating in the write-up of the, the articles. I think uh, field epidemiology has really changed the way we look at uh, preparedness for outbreaks. It has also changed the way we respond how timely we move into the field to investigate and also the quality of the data in the field. So we see our residents uh, trained in data collection skills, trained in data cleaning and also trained in data analysis. So as field epidemiologists we focus of course on collecting, comparing 
and communicating. So under collecting, we are ensuring that FETPs can, can contribute to quality data. Under comparing, we are also uh, teaching the residents in uh, more favorable or advanced statistical analysis. Um, right now, we have moved to R training, which I think is a very good uh, approach as a, pro, uh, as a program. And the, our residents are able to analyze data very fast and be able to produce those outputs. Uh, we were deployed to various um, field sites, and I was deployed at the Tropical Disease Research Center in Indora. And during the field placement, uh, we were involved in various activities. And of note, at the end of the year in 2019, uh, COVID-19 came into the picture and by March, uh, around mid-March 2020, Zambia recorded its first case of COVID-19 and Zambia Field Epidemiology Training Program uh, was involved in the response from the beginning. So Zambia Field Epidemiology tra Training Program played a critical role in the management of the, the first prevalence survey that was conducted in Zambia in June to July. My name is Marceline Mapie. I'm a resident at the South African Food Epidemiology Program. I'm here to share my food work experiences. As an FETP resident, I had unique experiences in COVID-19 food support in South Africa starting from monitoring and evaluating preparedness to COVID-19 response, attending to call center at the outbreak response unit. I also assisted in epidemiologic support in district, such as data management and contact tracing. I was also involved in data management and capacity building in different districts, as well as assisting in implementing COVID-19 guidelines and tools. I learned how to respond to outbreaks upscale my skills in data management and working together as a team in different districts with different experiences. I trained residents on data capturing. I did data quality check. I created SOP. I addressed members of the public on COVID-19, logging their queries, advised on prevention measures, and did data cleaning. investigated resurgence of COVID in Free State, assisted with data analysis and training. I did food bone illness outbreak investigation in Houghton. Greetings everyone, it's Ngoma Ngobile, an SAFTP resident. I, I give back to the communities or to the public health um, uh, community by uh, ensuring that I use my clinical background and my radio personality background to bring the information, accurate information to the communities to give back to the communities in that way that we get to stand in the gap and bring the accurate information to them. So I get to do the COVID on air um, slots with various radio stations as well as any other clinical um, setting that I always get invited into. Now that you have seen how individual FETPs are strengthening public health systems within their countries, I would like to highlight the work of regional FETP networks in building healthier regions. Recently, I had the opportunity to chat with the leaders of six FETP networks to hear more about their efforts to build field epidemiology capacity within their regions. So I'd like to welcome you all here today to begin the first panel discussion of the, our first World Field Epidemiology Day. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce myself and the panelists, and then we can begin with our questions and comments. My name is Carl Reddy. I'm the director of TEFINET, uh, based in Atlanta. Uh, Konki, may I ask you to introduce yourself, please? Hello, I'm Konki Kison, Executive Director of the South Asia Field Epidemiology and Technology Network, or SafetyNet. Uh, Simon? My name is Simon Antara. I'm Director of the African Field Epidemiology Network, AFINET. Franklin? 
Hi, everyone from Colombia. I am Franklin Prieto Alvarado. Um, I am the Technical Director of Public Health Surveillance Department in National Health Institute. Uh, National Health Institute has the EPTB program from uh, for uh, 30 years ago uh, and uh, I bring technical support to the Red Sur uh, for South America. Great. Stephen? Hi, I'm Stephen from Singapore, uh, the National University of Singapore and uh, National Centre for Infectious Diseases. I'm representing the Field Epidemiology Training Network of the 10 ASEAN countries, together with China, Japan and South Korea. Hey, Mohanad. Hello, everyone. Uh, I, I am Mohanad Jinsur. I am the director of uh, Eastern Mediterranean Public Health Network, Infinite. As and last... Thank you. Last but not least, David. Good morning, everyone. My name is David Rodriguez. Uh, I am the director of Central American uh, Field Epidemiology Network, RedSec. Thank you, David. So um, I have a question that I'd like to address. I'd like our respondents to address. And may I just add that it really is a pleasure having the directors of all our regional networks with us today. So the first question is, how are your networks field epidemiologists building a healthier region through response to COVID-19 or other health crises? And, uh, you know, I, I'm just going to call up randomly upon somebody to give us their input. And of course, other members of the panel are welcome to ask questions and comment thereafter. So, you know, may I turn this over to Konki? You know, would you be yeah. able to give us your answer, Konki? Well, I think the most important contribution that we have uh, uh, given or done is um, uh, having uh, helped with uh, build uh, robust surveillance systems, because you know we found out that that those who have robust surveillance systems and those who were able to uh, identify immediately this um, virus uh, going around in their in their countries were better able to cope and control uh, COVID earlier than than the rest of us, you know, and were able to uh, put the necessary recommendations and control measures. So. Um, I, I shall have to defer to the others, but I think surveillance is one of the uh, most important contribution that we have done towards a healthier region in South Asia. Okay, thanks, Konki. <clears throat> Mohanad, how, how has your region responded? How has your FETP responded? Thank you, Carl, for a very important question. Um, it's the Mediterranean Public Health Network. Infinite's engagement with the global health community allows it to identify opportunity for supporting gaps and needs in countries. Field epidemiology training programs, graduates and residents have played an important role in response to COVID-19 pandemic. They have been the major player and pillar in the preparedness and response to their of their countries, where they took charge of revision preparedness plan, controlling borders, doing contact tracing and case investigation, preparing health education materials, and much more. And in Eastern Mediterranean region, uh, and as in many other countries, field epidemiologists took charge of the response to COVID-19 and they were able to reflect commitment to this matter. Excellent, thank you for sharing that. You know, maybe to go to a completely different region now, Franklin, uh, how has your regional, how has your region responded? The, the, the South American EPTP complete in more than 20 years of development. Everything we can do to strengthen will become the basis for the implementation of the EPTP in the other countries. Uh, we believe uh, the South-South collaboration uh, with the support of DEFINET and CDC saves time in the development uh, of the EPTP in new countries. That means a chance through the scholarships, internships, or peer-to-peer -peer experience. Uh, sharing developer learning materials, 
access to online courses, technical support in the certification process, mentorship exchange, increasing the number of countries in the region with the VTP and with the current recognition of the role of the epidemiologists, especially field epidemiologists, uh, for decision makers, uh, the possibility of having a, a response network as proposal uh, by the GOA uh, would, would add a greater feasibility and sustainability. Faced with a public health emergency in a country, the network of field epidemiologists could support its containment through the exchange of experience, learning lessons and good practice. Uh, something like the FTP without barriers for collaboration between countries. This stronger network will improve health security for and between our countries, optimize collaboration at the borders, generate um, a real and effective immediate response, and controls risk for all in a timely manner. Um, the the FTP network is uh, in, in, in the, uh, is principal uh, actor, uh, play, play, player in, in this re response. Thank you, Franklin. You know, may I invite the other panelists that I haven't directly <clears throat> directed the question at? You know, are there any differences in the way your networks have responded? I mean, not only to COVID, right? But I, I know some regions have had challenges with other outbreaks at the same time as COVID. So do you have any comment or anything to add? Uh, uh, Simon, I see you would like to say something. Yes. Um, the vision of Afinet is a healthier Africa. Our work over the years reflects that vision. And with regards to the COVID-19 pandemic, the AFINET Corps of Disease Detectives is a critical component of the Continental Response Team. We have partnered with the Africa CDC, the US CDC, Ministries of Health, and many other organizations to deploy hundreds of field epidemiologists across the continent to respond not just to COVID-19, but as you know, uh, during this period of COVID-19, we also had uh, an Ebola virus disease outbreak in Guinea. An outbreak of Ebola virus disease has been declared in the Cote d'Ivoire. At the national level, our network field epidemiologists are playing critical roles in almost every pillar of the COVID-19 response. They are involved particularly in surveillance, epidemiological investigation, contact tracing, laboratories and diagnostics, infection prevention and control, implementation of various vaccination strategies and activities, including advocacy, demand creation, and surveillance to detect adverse events following immunization. In addition, they are involved in risk communication and community engagement, and of course, are helping to deal with the issue of uh, infodemics. They also conduct operational research to inform the direction of the response. In short, our regional network epidemiologists are such a great asset in the pandemic response. Great, you, you know, thank you for that. I, I did note that some of you mentioned training, you know, as part of how your field epidemiologists are building a healthier region. And coincidentally, my next question deals directly with training needs. So. The question is, what does your network perceive as the greatest training needs for building a competent field epidemiology workforce in your region? And then how is your network addressing these needs, right? So this time around, I'd like to direct the question to start with at Stephen. Well, uh, thanks, Carl. Uh, I think one of the greatest training needs thrown up, especially during the COVID-19 experience, is in how to competently implement public health social measures, uh, which include actions by individuals, such as safe distancing, mask wearing, and hygiene, and by the authorities involving mobility restrictions, ban on large gatherings, and uh, mass testing. Uh, among the challenges, some efforts carry unintended effects on the physical and mental health of individuals and affected not just lives, but livelihoods as well. So uh, through regional ex 
change. We are understanding and adopting each other's best practices. Uh, through use of media technologies, we are also improving our efforts to fight disinformation and bridging gaps in knowledge. And uh, through application of the social sciences, we are encouraging a whole of society approach to tackle the pandemic crisis. Thanks, uh, Stephen. David, in, in your region, I know you've been particularly active, you know, with regards to training. So what, what would your response be? Well, uh, our latest project has been for the ASEAN plus three countries to work together on a three-day workshop for risk communications. And this is, uh, we are working hard to build a healthier region through a variety of ways, including changing attitudes and behaviors in order to mitigate risk, fighting disinformation that is causing mistrust and addressing compliance fatigue in the community. Great, thank you, thank you. Da David, would you like to share your perspectives with us? Yes, Carol, thank you for, for the opportunity. Um, we in RedSec in Central America, FETPs, we perceive um, training needs in um, at least two uh, important uh, uh, teams, like uh, uh, One Health and, and Border Health also. We have uh, problems with uh, migrations, movements across all the region, not only from our countries, uh, persons going from our countries to, to the north, but also um, uh, um, with migrants um, um, from uh, another regions of the world that come to South America and then uh, they go through the north, uh, passing through Central America. So uh, there are um, uh, migrant flows that um, some years before we did not have. And uh, now there are needs for strengthening the surveillance at the border health. And also uh, in, in the topic of One Health, because uh, um, we have uh, different um, public health traits that we need to, uh, to establish a better um, surveillance system. Um, for example, um, uh, all the diseases uh, in the group of uh, um, um, uh, arboviral, uh, arboviral diseases is one example of our uh, challenges. So I think in the, in the curricula of FETP, we need to introduce topics. We need also to conduct trainings, emphasizing um, contents on, on border health and also in, in one health. And what uh, we are doing now, how we are um, um, uh, facing these, these challenges. Well, mainly in, in the FETP frontline curricula during the third workshop, we are including some materials. We are working together with the, the global team of, of border health and we are pilot, piloting some materials for introducing those on the, on the third workshops in, uh, in our region. And we are planning to do the same with uh, some materials of one, of one Health. For example, uh, we have the third workshop of the first um, uh, frontline cohort in Belize and uh, colleagues from um, CDC headquarters are going to pilot these materials of, of, uh, of uh, One Health. Belize. So um, I think at these are uh, our training needs and the challenge and how we are facilitating. Thank you. Great. Thanks, David. You know, I wanted to go to Mohanad next. I mean, clearly, David, your training needs articulate uh, well with your challenges, right? And I know another region that has many different kinds of challenges is that of the Middle East. So Mohanad, would you like to respond? Yeah. Thank you. So one road we uh, opted to take during COVID-19 is the online training or online uh, learning approach. We managed to launch our own learning management uh, system uh, with the three uh, COVID-19 courses related to rapid response, risk communication, and infection control. 
that they were developed based on the request and needs of our countries. These courses were received well by countries and their uptake was encouraging. We believe although COVID-19 gave us very tough time, but we still we believe that the future holds a lot of opportunities and we are working on launching more online learning courses that can uh, meet the training needs uh, for building a competent field epidemiology workforce on uh, the globe uh, and possibly beyond our region and uh, beyond. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mohanad Konki. I, I see you, you had your hand up. I mean, could you share your experience with us? Yeah, well, we appreciate Infinite for leading the way where learning management system or LMS is concerned, because I guess that's the way to go over the situation it's concerned. However, the challenge still is how to come up with a stable of well-motivated, competent, and passionate uh, supervisors and mentors without whom, whatever, however good our initial training, our classroom training may be, you know, um, uh, it, it may not work. As a matter of fact, the supervisors and the mentors are the ones who make a difference where FETP is concerned, especially with the advent of COVID, wherein we do want to mass produce field epidemiologists and we have intermediate course and we have the, the, the short courses, which um, limits, which has a limited time for training. And then we, 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 we let them loose in the field. These are the people who really, really need supervisors and mentors. And that is the challenge that we are facing now, how to come up with a stable of good supervisors and mentors. Wonderful. Uh, Franklin, I thought I saw your hand up briefly. I'm not sure if you wanted to comment. Yes, uh, complimenting uh, uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic means looking for alternatives for training and online education was more strongly integrated into our process. Uh, the continuity of training activities through the use of the online platforms despite social distancing. Uh, this Tools include the development of learning management system, the construction of the online learning objects, the implementation uh, of gamification, the design of multimedia material. Um, professionals in training and um, graduates require training in some topics as a new statistical techniques. The use of capture tools on mobile device, data visualization, innovative or digital surveillance, understanding contagion networks, and risk management by they um, also require continuing edu education on topics that are part of the curriculum, such as risk communication, ethics on public health surveillance, and tools for field work. Excellent, excellent. And uh, Simon, I see you, you had something to say. Please share with us. Well, uh, in addition to what my colleagues have listed as training needs, I think for us here, the greatest needs are access to opportunities for field epidemiology capacity development and where these opportunities exist, sustaining them. And of course, quality of the training is one of the, uh, these, are, these are all um, needs that we have. As we all know, there are still many countries, particularly in Africa, but of course, also in other parts of the developing world that do not yet have any tier of FETP. They do not have access to opportunities to develop field epidemiology capacity to strengthen their health systems. And what that means is that such countries lack a critical element for public health emergency response. When such countries are faced with public health emergencies, they are unable to mount a formidable response to mitigate the health economic and social consequences of these events. A weak response portends danger for spread within countries and across borders. And that is certainly not good for uh, continental and global public health security. And therefore, for us, the starting point is access, addressing the issue of access and opportunities for all countries to develop field epidemiology capacity for their health system is critical. Once we have these 
programs established, we need to institutionalize them to enhance their sustainability. We need to gain national ownership of the program, both in West and in DEET. It is also very important to address the issue of quality of the training program, because a high quality program that is contributing meaningfully to national, continental, and global public health uh, is likely to attract resources and achieve sustainability. Now, dealing with these challenges, there are a lot of uh, issues. One is the lack of resources to undertake a radical or if you like a revolutionary approach in expanding training opportunities. To deal with this, we are working with various partners. Of course, we're working with the US CDC, the Africa CDC, TEFINET, and sub-regional bodies such as the West African Health Organization, the East African Community, the Intergovernmental Authority uh, for Development. In terms of uh, institutionalization, we are engaging with the ministries of health and we are urging them to own this program, not just in West, but allocate budgets and put resources in that to sustain these programs. Of course, when it comes to quality issues, we are working at AFINA level through the AFINA star rating system, where we monitor the quality of our training, our training programs annually and support programs to deal with the challenges that are identified. But of course, we've also asked all our programs to submit themselves to the definite accreditation process. I am very happy that we have the FETP enterprise and the FETP roadmap. This, I think, will definitely contribute very significantly. It will change the way we do FETP in terms of its expansion, in terms of its quality, but also in terms of making sure that when we graduate our residents, that there is a system to pick them up so that we can reap the benefits of the investment. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. You know, in view of what you've all shared, my last question is, is very interesting. And um, I'd like you to now think about this. If you could have just one wish come true related to field epidemiology in your region, what would that wish be? Okay. So, I mean, you know, the expression, if wishes were horses, beggars would fly. So, you know, <laughs> please let, I'd, I'd like to start with Stephen this time around. If you could have one wish come true, Stephen, for field epidemiology, mm. what would that be? My wish would be for much more regional capacity building in meaningful ways. Countries really need a better understanding of the role of field epidemiology to be able to make evidence-informed decisions about public health interventions. And all of us are facing major challenges during this pandemic, especially to continue training our frontliners and rapid responders. We must be flexible and innovate with online training, while at the same time, we must also be careful not to compromise on learning quality. Thanks, Stephen. Um, David, what, what would your wish be? Well, Carol, um, we um, in Central America try to um, um, build the or implement the FETP more than a program uh, for developing human resources. And um, for example, doing advocacy with, with the um, national authorities and also trying to show uh, the impact of the trainings and the, and the impact of the work of our residents uh, for improving the surveillance system. I think uh, we try to show that FETP is, is more than a, a, a program for developing human resources and that it is an um, a strategy to improve the surveillance system. And this uh, situation with the COVID-19 pandemic has been a very good opportunity to show that. I think uh, we need to uh, move forward to, to push a little bit more in order to um, um, put our program in a place that is really recognized not only by our colleagues, because field epidemiologists know about the program, but uh, most important, the national authorities in order to get um, support in the future. 
Thanks, David. Konki, what would your wish be? Well, I wish that there was a common language in Asia so that we would all be able to understand it, easier for us to learn. However, it looks like that is not going to happen. So um, somebody from World Bank said that money is not like the holy grail that you throw into anything and voila, your, your, your problems are over. But I wish that there was the authority that would allow us or would say that a particular percentage of the budget really be dedicated. I know that there is a particular budget dedicated to health, but other than that, really dedicated to epidemiology and outbreak and its concerns. That's my wish. Thanks, thanks. Simon, what, what would your wish be? I have a single composite one, and it emanates from the challenges I've already outlined. And what is it? My wish is that all countries will have access to sustain opportunities to develop field epidemiology capacity at all levels to strengthen their health system. This certainly means increased investment in field epidemiology capacity development. And this is very critical for global health security. Okay. Uh, Franklin, what would your wish be? Um, epidemiology in general is in the speech of decision makers and in the understanding of the rail by the community. As field epidemiologists, we have become the basis of the response in our countries for different elements. Uh, put knowledge into practice. Um, we now, our countries, we have a, a travel around our countries. We have walked around. We know how we live. We know the needs of our people. And that makes the public health programs have context, real life. Uh, we consider uh, our authorities um, establish the FTP as a priority. Okay. And last but not least, Mohanad, what would your Thank wish you very be? much. I think I, I will join the, my colleague Simon and uh, with the growing need to increase country capacity in preparedness and response, especially in Eastern Mediterranean region with instability, displacement, immigrations, wars, it would be a dream come true if we have an FETB in every country in our region. COVID-19 pandemic, uh, uh, uncover the essential role of, the, uh, role of these programs. And we are all working toward attaining measure and supporting of the global health security. Then one of the ideal measure would be to help all countries to establish their own FETB. Of course, you know, as Konki mentioned, the establishment of these programs require time, money, money. and resources. So it remains I wish that we will continue to work on mobilizing resources to make it come true. Thank you. Thank you, Mohanad. You know, I, I'd really like to thank you all for sharing your thoughts and your ideas with us this morning. And it's really been a pleasure. So thank you very much, colleagues, for making yourself available and for the time that you've taken to be with us this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carl, for giving us this opportunity. Best wishes to everyone on Worldview Epidemiology Day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay safe. Yeah, stay safe. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Hello, everyone. My name is Pat Drury. I work at the World Health Organization, and I'm the manager of the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network, known as GORN. On this, the first World Field Epidemiology Day, thank you for this opportunity to celebrate the work and the dedication of field epidemiologists around the world. I'm very honored to join you to acknowledge and advocate for this vital role. On behalf of the Global Outbreak Alert and Response Network and your friends and colleagues in the operational support team here at the World Health Organization, I want first to recognize the tremendous contribution that training programs, regional networks, and TEFINET have made and must continue to make in outbreak alert and response. We have had 
the great honor of collaborating and working closely with this community for over two decades and have built many enduring friendships. In 2000, there was already growing recognition that an outbreak anywhere can potentially represent an emergency of international or global concern. We know that no single institution or country has all of the capacities to respond to these global public health emergencies, uh, including the current pandemic or future new and emerging infectious diseases. This has never been more true than today, as we all struggle with this pandemic. Tefinet, together with WHO and other major partners, helped set up GORN initially. The shared aim at the time was to improve coordination of international outbreak response and to provide an operational framework for the rapid deployment of international technical support countries. From those very early days, one of the core guiding principles of the network has been that responses would build global capacity by involving field training programs in applied epidemiology and public health practice, what we all know otherwise as the FETPs. Over the past 20 years, we have deployed over 3,400 international experts in outbreak response teams. Of those, we have deployed 1,179 field epidemiologists to all of the major disease outbreaks and emergencies. Many of the other deployers have also been trained field epidemiologists. Our admiration and thoughts are first and foremost with those colleagues who often put their lives on the line, deploying in humanitarian emergencies and situations of considerable insecurity. Those field epidemiologists have supported 170 international missions in over 100 countries worldwide. Their work in the field has helped control many major outbreaks and saved lives. In addition, their field reports, the operational recommendations and debriefings have documented these experiences, contributed to our learning and understanding, and helped with innovations in all aspects of outbreak response. An important part has been that GORN partners with TEFINET on our outbreak response training program and has benefited so much from that collaboration. Field epidemiologists are absolutely essential in field investigations, in contact tracing, working across borders and across disciplines. The field epi is essential to the engagement and trust of communities, to the coordination of multidisciplinary teams, to the data that should drive decisions and advice, and to the adaptation and delivery of that advice targeted to support the, the peoples responding to these outbreaks. This pandemic has exposed weaknesses and vulnerabilities in the public health systems at all levels, challenging us to develop our capacities and resilience to future threats. It has, however, also highlighted the strengths, and key among those is the value of investing in field epidemiology capacity. There are many straight strengths excuse me, in this global field epidemiology community, not least the tremendous personal and professional networks, the collegiality and the support that is such a key feature uh, of this group. The strong and direct connections between the programs and ministries of health and national health author authorities and institutions and the regional and global networks are critical. Human society worldwide is more connected, more complex than ever, and our health challenges grow by the day. It's crucially important to support the further development of this workforce to meet the needs of countries and the global community. It's frankly a matter of life and death, as well as essential health systems, social and economic life and political stability. Thank you to our field EPI colleagues from across the global community, those who have worked with those most directly affected by outbreaks, with local communities and with health authorities with ministries, GORN partners, and with WHO at all levels. It's deeply appreciated. Congratulations again on the first World Field Epidemiology Day, and we look forward to many more in the future. Thank you very much. In an effort to raise awareness of field epidemiology's unique methodologies and to provide a venue for FET participants to publish their work,
Tefinet has collaborated with the International Journal of Infectious Diseases to publish a journal supplement honoring the first World Field Epidemiology Day. In our next session, Dr. Angela Hilmers, Tefinet's Director of Strategic and Technical Initiatives, chats with three of the authors who published their work in this supplement about their journeys to publication. I hope that FETP trainees and graduates who hope to publish their own research are inspired by their stories. Hello everyone, thank you so much for investing your time with us today and welcome to our session. My name is Angela Hilmers, I'm the Director of Strategic and Technical Initiatives at DEFINET and the guest editor of the first scientific supplement uh, to the International Journal of Infectious Diseases in honor of World Field Epidemiology Day. Through our supplement, we showcase important and timely investigations from our FETP fellows and grads around the world. We raise awareness of the unique field epidemiology methodologies and techniques, and we also promote um, FETP contributions to health systems that are strong and resilient. Today, we have the pleasure of introducing three authors from our supplement who will walk us through their journeys to publication. Our first panelist is Fernando Reis, who is a resident of the Brazilian FETP Episus. He studied pharmacy in Brazil and then pursued a master's in international health and tropical medicine at the University of Oxford. His interests are vaccine development and deployment, particularly in low-income countries. Our second panelist is Ihab Ahmed al Sakaf who is a general physician and a resident of the Yemen FETP. His first experience in publishing with us um, in a peer-reviewed journal, and his work has been featured in a BBC documentary, Yemen Coronavirus in a War Zone, which has been premiered in December 2020. And our last but not least panelist is Bernice Maggie, who is a resident at the National Department of Health in Papua New Guinea. She currently works as an FETP convener at the FETP Papua New Guinea office in Port Moresby. He has worked, she has worked as a clinician at the Rural District Hospital and then moved on to managing and coordinating public health programs and disease surveillance at a district level. This is also her first time publishing with his, her investigation in a peer review journal. So with that, welcome to our, our panelists uh, and we're just gonna start with the first question. Can you tell us briefly about your investigation? Hi, Angela. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Um, about our investigation, so basically we were called to respond to a COVID-19 outbreak in a prison complex, hosting over 13,000 prisoners here in Brasilia. And we spent three months doing a few different studies, and one of, one of them was actually monitoring all 150 prisoners over 60 years of age who had been allocated in a different block for better monitoring. And we observed that approximately 90% of them had had contact or had been infected uh, with the new coronavirus, but none of them actually died as a result of the infection. So in the paper, we better discuss the actions that were taken by uh, the local health team that might have contributed to such positive outcomes. Thank you, uh, Angela, and thank you, everybody. I am so glad to be here with you uh, about my, my uh, investigation. As we know, uh, in the northern uh, governor rates of Yemen, uh, which, were, uh, which are considered of, uh, free of COVID-19 until uh, the 24th of April, 2020, when uh, the first report about uh, uh, suspe two suspected cases of COVID-19 were received uh, by the General Directorate of Surveillance and Control Disease at the Ministry of Public Health and Regulation. During uh, this, a team uh, from uh, Yemen FATV was uh, deployed to investigate about this uh, outbreak and to confirm the existence of this uh, COVID-19 and conduct uh, contact tracing and finally uh, make a recommendation uh, for preventing and uh, control. Uh, thank you. Um, I was involved in this uh, study as investigation. This is a national uh, healthcare worker survey uh, uh, due to 
load testing half take, which the country ask us to conduct the survey so about the various what challenges health workers were facing in in swabbing patients for COVID-19, even though there were more respiratory cases, but low swabbing down and testing was really low. So basically we had to conduct this uh, study. It was a multi-methods cross-sectional study incorporating both uh, research method, the quantitative method we had to do through the conduct the uh, telephone interviews with uh, 579 healthcare workers and uh, field interviews with healthcare workers working out in the field. Uh, basically, is to understand from the healthcare workers' uh, perspective the challenges they face in swabbing patients, and also important to identify the local solutions that can be used to address those challenges in order to uh, improve. Uh, swabbing so that the testing coverage can be increased. We know that as professional during response testing, data from the testing is very important to guide the response in any outbreak and for this in case for COVID-19 outbreak. So I was involved in this uh, nationwide survey. Thank you. Thank you very much. And in but since this is a, a, a session in, in which you walk us through the, your journey to publication, so from the, the completion of this investigation, what motivated you to go a step further and disseminate your findings through an academic journal? Well, I have the feeling that sometimes for the epidemiologists, they may not see publishing as an important aspect of their jobs at least not in peer-reviewed journals. So um, it's more or less like as if our main goal is to provide a rapid response to the health service and publishing is actually something for academics. But in our case, when we were called to action, there were no reports on the impact of COVID-19 in prison settings. And this was at the very early stages of the pandemic here in Brazil. So local authorities, they were still uncertain about how quickly it could spread in a prison setting and what would be the disease burden uh, in such populations. And also how could we manage the outbreak given the limited resources that we had at the time. And if you saw the guidelines, you will basically see um, test and isolate as recommendations. But what if you don't have enough resources for appropriate testing? And what if individual isolation is not possible due to overcrowding? So in many ways, we had to learn on the field what strategies work better in our own context. And I believe that other professionals across Brazil or even in other countries, uh, they might have been facing similar challenges and publishing our results was a way of sharing our experience, what we faced and also um, some best practice uh, so that others could also benefit from our work. Uh, for me, uh, actually, uh, I have two things uh, pushed and motivated me to publish my result. The first thing, uh, especially when the uh, investigation confirmed the presence of uh, COVID-19 in North, uh, in North uh, Yemen, uh, is uh, to achieve my uh, goal and in increasing the awareness about all uh, things related to COVID-19, especially in light uh, of the presence of a lot of a lot of, a lot of number a number of uh, rumors uh, that lead to increase the mortality and morbidity uh, of COVID-19 in Yemen. The second and the most important uh, uh, things uh, that was my grandmother uh, was infected uh, with COVID-19 in June, uh, to, uh, in, in 21st of June, 2020. Uh, during the first wave, her situation was uh, severe because she's old uh, age, uh, 97 years old, and have a critical, uh, uh, critical uh, situation, where, which was chronic disease, hypertensive, uh, diabetic mellitus, and ischemic heart disease. Uh, she refused to admit it to the hospital, and she forced me to uh, take care of her and treat her uh, here, uh, at the home where I had uh, established a semi-intensive care uh, room in my uh, uh, house that contained all uh, medical equipment 
such as oxygen generator, oxygen cylinder, uh, pulse oximeter, and syringe bomb extra, as well as doing uh, investigation in the nearest uh, private laboratory. Uh, also, for the visitors, I applied all major uh, all measures of infection prevention and control. And Alhamdulillah, uh, uh, my grandmother has improved and recovered from uh, the COVID-19. But in the second wave, also she uh, has infected again, and his uh, situation was critical than the first one. And um, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, she was uh, died on uh, the 21st of April, 2021. Uh, uh, may her soul uh, rest in, in peace. Thank you. Um, for me, the initial thought for the survey was actually to address the situation due to low testing uh, coverage based on the findings and recommendations from the study to guide the national response. And uh, what motivated and pushed me to get the results published was through the FETP faculty and the mentors. Uh, seeing that it was the first uh, COVID-19 uh, study done in the country and with different mixed methods that we employed to do the survey. So with, and then we see that uh, the, from the findings, there were some interesting results that we found that we would like to share. We anticipate this could be experienced by health workers in other countries who may be facing similar situation uh, in their country in regards to COVID-19 response. So it's a first telephone uh, survey that we did in the country and with the incredible response rate, we see that from this study in it's feasible in Papua New Guinea for future uh, uh, researchers who are thinking of uh, uh, using telephone to conduct their research in the future. So that was the whole reason that uh, we I had to submit, get my uh, research work submitted for publication. Thank you, and um, Thank you. our condolences um, you have for the passing of your grandmother. I think situations are such as very different, difficult right now in Yemen. So. Um, Take us through your journey to publication. I know there are a different a number of barriers that you guys had to face during your investigation. Can you walk us through that? Well, working in a prison setting was definitely a challenging experience. I had never entered a prison complex before, and there were many external factors that we had to consider in order to plan and develop a good work. For example, we had to be creative in terms of logistics and transportation. Um, our data collection had to be performed without any electronic device. We had also a limited amount of hours to perform, to collect our data, and our schedule changed multiple times as well. And we also had to learn how to better approach prisoners in order to get them to our site. Um, and that demanded a lot of efforts. So for example, this included clarifying to them the importance of testing and also that isolation was a measure for their own safety and not a punishment. So in summary, I think that we had to learn how to adapt ourselves and be flexible to do the best we could in the circumstances that we were in. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, Yemen was free of coronavirus uh, due to the seven years of uh, war and harsh situation in Yemen. However, the first two confirmed cases were recorded in April 2020. Uh, the team faced, uh, faced a difficulty in contact tracing and collecting data and samples due to the stigma and uh, the large number of rumors about COVID-19. So it was a very difficult co uh, to convince the Yemeni society about COVID-19. Me and uh, my team were from a few people in the Ministry of Health who know the scale of uh, COVID-19 problem. So it was necessary to int intensify our efforts and convince the authorities and police maker uh, to, of the high need of announce and warn the citizen to be careful and avoid crowding uh, as much as possible with the need to take the necessary measures and action to control and prevent
the virus uh, to limit its spread. For the survey that we conducted uh, with uh, looking at the barriers, some operational uh, challenges with the investigation and the data collection was uh, logistics mainly. Uh, we ran out the phone credits uh, between the interviews and then the phone cutoff, we had to uh, call off the interview. Uh, sometimes communication issues with some of the provincials that have network issues that we were unable to reach health workers. And there are some challenges with health workers. Some of them were reluctant to participate. Uh, they were questioning if the survey that we conducted, we got the approval from the province or through their management that they need to be aware before they give their full participation. So some were as to tend to release information from their organization, especially, you know, dealing with uh, COVID-19 situation, we need to sensitive and they were also in fear and they don't want to give some of the information from the organization. And health workers were interested. They were not interested with COVID-19. They said, oh, we have other public health programs that is of importance and major concern than COVID-19. We don't want to participate in COVID-19. It's just taking up our time. So like these are just some of the challenges that we experienced with healthcare workers during our investigation and data collection. And also like previously we've been discussing on delay in getting the IRB approval also. This also, you know, sometimes makes us hesitant, especially with ethical issues that we will be hesitant to collect our data. Once we have this, it gives us drive and push to go ahead to collect data. Thank you. So now that the investigation has been completed, despite all the challenges you guys had to face in the field, what additional challenges you had to face now in your when you're attempting to publish your work? Well, I believe that a key challenge is actually obtaining ethical approval. Um, many times the response to a public health emergency requires being deployed to the field shortly after the problem is spotted with immediate, immediate start of data collection. Um, but this is a very different approach than unusual academic work where you may have many months in order to plan and design your study. Um, and although we do not have this time, scientific journals, they may still require ethical approval for publishing our results. And something that the Brazilian FETP has done that maybe could also be helpful for other um, fellows is to communicate with the ethical board early on and during the investigation process to arrange for fast track evaluation of the studies. Uh, honestly, the most important obstacle uh, that I uh, faced during the publishing is the difficulty and delay in obtaining the approval for publication because uh, the authorities don't, uh, don't want to create a panic and fear among uh, uh, Yemeni citizens when announcing about COVID-19 and all the sequences issue related to that, starting from uh, mitigation till closure and quarantine, especially when Yemen was considered uh, as the, the worst humanitarian uh, crisis country in the world. Uh, besides uh, operational challenges like what Fernando and her best mentioned regarding the IRB approval, sometimes also we can look at the individual challenges, you know, if you have don't show commitment or that self-determination to get your work, this is one also one challenge that will hold you back in publishing your work or if mentoring or motivation from your mentors may be also be a challenge. So sometimes like if this happens, then you don't back off, mentors suggest to guide you. So you, it, these are like some of the indivi individual challenges that can also stop you from publishing your work apart besides from the other operational challenges like uh, IRB approval. 
So your work has been uh, was published actually online recently, and today is going to be part of our full supplement. Uh, how would you describe the impact of publishing your work on your colleagues, your program, and the public health community? Well, internally, it has been very well received by both colleagues and supervisors. I think it was also a good way of encouraging new fellows to engage in publishing. And the local health authorities um, and also the security officers, they were able to use our data in order to improve their isolation and testing protocols, which was a very nice experience as well. In fact, uh, it had a big impact starting from my residence who received this uh, with the great happiness as it uh, motivates them to hurry up and publish uh, uh, their scientific papers. And uh, for the program director, he congratulated me on the success I achieved and shared my article with all the Yemen FATB graduates and all stakeholders related to COVID-19. Concerning public health, as my article uh, should light on the most affected group uh, from COVID-19, which was the health workers, the authorities paid more attention to them and tried to provide COVID-19 uh, vaccination for them as soon as possible. For Papua New Guinea, the uh, results from the survey was internally. I did a presentation with the National Task Force, uh, uh, Interagency Task Force for COVID-19. It was well accepted. Uh, only out from the survey, we prioritize the findings and we focus on three major recommendations that is of agent that we want to make sure that will have an impact in our testing coverage so that decisions can help, that testing data can help improve our uh, guide the response for COVID-19. So we uh, recommend for NNS testing and training for NNS training for health coworkers and then just to um, look at the uh, development of community and healthcare worker engagement through risk communication, more awareness, with NNS training, focus on the rollout of RDT and uh, the other testing platform, which is RDT and rapid uh, response training for the healthcare workers to build capacity and also for to make sure that monitoring and system in place to monitor the logistics and equipment. So when those priority areas that we address, we see that the testing, uh, more people, uh, more swabbing were done by uh, health workers uh, that therefore that increased the testing coverage and the data helped to guide the response in the country. And uh, the testing rate is increasing gradually after the survey and the findings and the response was implemented through the, through the interventions that uh, arise from the recommendations from the res uh, research that was conducted. Excellent, let's talk about impact on you. So how has this publishing process helped you to develop personally or professionally? Well, this publishing experience gave me the opportunity to have feedback from peers coming from very different settings than ours. And I particularly like to have different point of views on our work and which always uh, help us to get new insights on how we can improve uh, our, our missions. And besides that, I guess that all the background, the background reading that we had to do uh, in order to develop the introduction and the discussion parts of the paper, it gave me a deeper understanding of all the struggles faced by health professionals in promoting uh, health, health within prison settings. And not only here in Brazil, but also worldwide. And this definitely helped me to appreciate such work. And for example, I am still in contact today with the local health officers from the prison complex, and we still discuss public health interventions one year later. Uh, on, on a personal level, yes, it was a great uh, opportunity 
which I, I, I gained a lot of uh, experience during all publication stage, starting from uh, submitting the abstract till uh, review, uh, then uh, uh, respond to the peer review comments, uh, then to the publish, and also to increase uh, my communication uh, skills to work with the organizations and to participate in uh, conferences uh, as uh, I received many invitation from the international conference to participate with them as uh, a speaker, uh, such as International Conference on Nursing and Public Health 2021, which will be held uh, in Switzerland from November uh, 15, 17, 2021. As, as for me personally, you know, first time to publish this book or write this research paper, I said, okay, it's a challenge. Like personally, I said, okay, I will accept this challenge and take it on. And then on top of that challenge, I said, I have to put in, give my, myself to it, huh? to give commitment to that work. And you have to have this uh, inner drive in you, self-determination to and also be enthusiastic to learn new things. Uh, you know, getting paper published at the professional level, different journals, different publication sites have their own criteria. That That's one thing that I learn, I learn from. And also, you know, it gives me, I have the courage and confidence and some experience in at least writing an abstract or manuscript to submit for publication uh, through this, through this experience with this uh, study that I've conducted and also like building up networks with other FETP in the country, in the world. Like now I come to know Fernando and Heb is through this platform that creates opportunity to meet others, learn from each other, sharing experiences, ideas, or new research methodology that they are using to do their research. So this is at the, professionally I come to, I'm exposed to this and learn also. Thank you. So we received more than 200 submission inquiries. This was a very competitive process uh, for this first World Field Epiday scientific supplement, which signals to us a great interest from fellows and grads to publish. What recommendations would you give to FETPs who are thinking of publishing in the future? I think that an important part of the process is understanding what would be the most suitable journal for you to submit your research. So look for similar studies and see where they have been published. Ask yourself um, how those manuscripts were structured. Um, is my research suitable or most suitable to be published as an original research piece or would a short communication be most appropriate, for example. And having these questions in mind, it would definitely be a good start in increasing your chances to have your research published. And also, if your research involves primary data collection, um, it could be helpful for you to prepare ethics uh, approval forms early on during the investigation process. Yes, uh, the, the insist and the hard work together are the keys to success. So I want to tell all the FATB uh, who are thinking uh, of publishing in the future, just uh, keep going and you will uh, finally uh, do it. Uh, as our professor, Dr. Abdul Wahid Asrouri, the Yemen uh, FATB technical advisor has always used to tell us publish or perish. So uh, this words inspired me a lot. And from this uh, platform, I want to thank uh, him a lot. And I want to say, uh, I promise, uh, sir, I will not forget that. Thank you, yes. From the experience and from the journey from data collection up to publication, you know, we make mistakes, so we go through challenges and we would like to share this experience and encourage our fellow FTPs out in the field that uh, every research or study that you do, you have already put in time and effort. And just make sure that at, at the end of that, get your paper 
published. It may be a new findings. It may be like what Fernando said, maybe new research uh, methodologies, or maybe the article has not been published. This may be new, but sharing your research paper, getting it published, it's also it also can help other future researchers can look back, uh, reference that in their future research as well. And also I agree with uh, Fernando, especially your survey, if it involves ethical, then it's better to get the IRB approval before your actual investigation and data collection. And when it comes to a stage for publication, there is no hassle because you have already got the IRB approval. It will be easy for publication. Thank you. Well, we are at the end of our panel session today. Thank you very much, um, Fernando, we have and Bernie for your participation. Do you have any final words to, to our audience today before we close? Yeah, just wanted to thank you for having us here. It's been a great experience and it was very nice to learn from our colleagues as well from different settings and with the different experiences. So thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Angela, thank you, and thank you uh, for uh, uh, me, uh, making me there, uh, here and uh, to Tiffany, which make uh, a good uh, opportunity for us to uh, participate in this uh, event for the first time. And uh, for all of ATB in the world, uh, uh, work hard and uh, you will be uh, here as us. Uh, thank you to the definite uh, te technical team for accepting my supplement for publication. I uh, greatly appreciate the opportunity given to uh, share my research journey from data collection to publication. Hope I provided some tips and motivation to our FATP colleagues out there who are looking forward to doing research and aim to get your work published. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to meet the other two uh, colleagues, Fernando and Hap. Great knowing you all. Thank you. And finally, yeah, finally, mega gratitude to Angela and the Tefinet communications team. You guys are great. And thank you for this opportunity given. Thanks. So thank you very much. If you guys would like to um, reach out to Fernando, Ihab, and Bernie just to learn more about her experience, their experiences with publication and additional tips we are um, sharing with you, their contact information. Uh, we also are um, launching our supplement, as I mentioned today, so you can read their full papers there who, that are online and available. And finally, it's just um, as an additional um, resource for our FETP fellows and grads who are thinking about publishing, we are launching a series of webinars this month on scientific writing and publishing for you. So with that, thank you very much again and have a good morning, good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank it's you. good night from Papua New Guinea to you all. Greetings. My name is Dr. Rebecca Martin, and I am the Vice President for Global Health and the Director of the Global Health Institute at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. I am honored to be part of the first World Field Epidemiology Day and to participate in this virtual event. I would like to thank the organizers, TEFINET, for inviting me to provide remarks at this inaugural event to recognize all disease detectives for their contributions to the health and security of the world. The 7th of September has been designated as the moment each year the world will recognize and celebrate field epidemiologists. As everyone has learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, the public health workforce is the cornerstone of a country's health security. In April 2020, Robin Taylor Wilson and co-authors published an article entitled, A Deficit of More Than 250,000 Public Health Workers Is No Way to Fight COVID-19. In it, they reminded us of a 2008 warning by the Association of Schools and Programs in Public Health that the United States faced a shortfall of more than 250,000 public health workers by 2020. The association called for action to one, expand the public health workforce in the United States, 
to increase the resources to promote worker training, and three, estimate the needed size of the public health workforce now and in the future. Their warning was correct, not just in the US, but around the world. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen countries around the world face shortfalls in the number of field epidemiologists. World Field Epidemiology Day is a time to increase the awareness of the Field Epidemiology Training Program, FETP, and the recently established FETP Enterprise, which supports training field epidemiologists and deploying them at the national and subnational levels. FETP is and should remain the guardian and custodian of public health workforce capacity building around the world. The Global Field Epidemiology Roadmap, launched in October of 2019, is a guide to build and strengthen quality and resilient field epidemiologists in all countries, and it charts a path to expand partnerships and ensure coordination through high-level leadership. This roadmap is comprised of the FETP enterprise and key recommendations to achieve a vision that every country in the world has the applied epidemiology capacities needed to protect and promote the health of its own population and to collaborate with others to promote global health. There is much work to be done, but the path is clear. There is a need to develop evidence-based norms and standards and policies to advocate for support of the FETP enterprise from country level to the global network, to promote modernization of FETP curricula, and to advocate for the institutionalization of FETPs at country level. Field epidemiology training programs are critical to accelerate public health workforce development and to achieve global health security. We have understood this since the 1980s when the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention partnered with the World Health Organization and the Thailand Ministry of Public Health to launch the first FETP outside North America. Since then, many countries have developed national FETPs and we have seen networks build regional field epidemiology programs. Support to FETPs by country governments, partners, and multilateral organizations has significantly enhanced global health security by building a global workforce with competencies in surveillance and outbreak detection and response. The COVID-19 pandemic and periodic large infectious disease outbreaks such as Ebola remind us of the need for countries to invest in a trained public health workforce for greater resilience and healthcare detection and response capacity. The first World Field Epidemiology Day marks a global movement to increase awareness of the essential role of field epidemiologists worldwide in protecting the health of populations, reducing health disparities, and advancing global health security. So please, Take a moment on the 7th of September to act, share your personal stories, and join together to recognize field epidemiologists. Thank you. On behalf of Tefinet, I would like to thank our audience again for joining us today for the first World Field Epidemiology Day. Together, we can make a strong case for increased investment in field epidemiology training for the health of the world. If you are a field epidemiologist who is active on social media, I encourage you to share your story today and use the hashtag World Field Epidemiology Day. Now, it is my pleasure to invite you to join our partners at EMFNET, the Eastern Mediterranean Public Health Network for a webinar introducing the Global Field Epidemiology Roadmap. Their webinar will begin in a few minutes. For more information, please visit the M website at www.emphnet.net. Thank you and be well.